Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest on this program is President Richard LaRiviere here at the University of Oregon. A scholar of Sanskrit and Hindu religions and legal traditions, La Riviere has served as president of the University of Oregon since July 2009. Richard, it's your third visit to us. Welcome back. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. The first time you came, you had barely set foot on campus. That's right. <laughs> and last year, when we talked at length, and you had a year under your belt, your primary focus was the new partnership, trying to renegotiate the, the, the relationship between the University of Oregon and the state. Right. In the 12 months that have elapsed, a great deal has shifted. Can you catch us up on where things stand? Well, uh, we had a very good uh, session in the legislature last year. Uh, we got two, uh, well, actually three very important pieces of legislation passed. Um, the two dominant ones were Senate Bill uh, 242 and 909 that basically shifted the university system status from state agency to uh, an instrumentality of the state, I think is the term of art now, which means that we are freed from many of the bureaucratic constraints that make a lot of sense for different kinds of state agencies, but not for universities, purchasing and uh, just general governance sorts of things. And Senate Bill 909, which uh, creates something called the Oregon Education Investment Board, which is uh, going to restructure completely the way the state invests in education. And that is really powerful. Uh, and it's going to change the landscape of education in Oregon. Senate Bill 909 uh, is the genius of John Kitzhopper, the governor, uh, who understood that if you're spending 60 cents of every tax dollar on education, that it probably makes some sense to figure out whether it's having the effect you want across the board. And so for the first time in Oregon's history, we will have a kind of coherent educational plan for birth through graduate school. And I'm really excited about the prospects. Lots of details will be worked out yet, but I'm very encouraged. So one of the things that has happened is you have backed off to some extent the, um, the push to make the University of Oregon negotiate separately with the state legislature. Well, actually, uh, no. Okay. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, this has now become part of the governor's uh, plan. And so uh, we're in the wonderfully luxurious position of not having to run our own bill, but rather having to simply support the governor's plan. You have run into some opposition from the state board uh, on your advocacy for this particular institution and in making the distinction between the U of O and our sister institutions. Um, the board's not been happy with it. You can see it from their point of view. But why do you feel that the University of Oregon is in a unique position on this? Well, um, first of all, you need to understand that Higher education is probably the most conservative arena of activity in America. Uh, we're perfectly capable of advising you how to run your business, but please don't tell us how to run our business. Uh, and so change in general is, is a hard thing for universities and university communities to adapt to. <coughs> um, so the, I, I understand very well the state board's concern about the changes we've been advocating. What we're really trying to do is to preserve the public mission of, of a world-class university. And if you look at the trends in the whole country, the trend is to gradually, quietly, unconsciously privatize these universities, raise the cost of attendance, uh, raise the profile of the students who attend in terms of SAT scores, GPAs, et cetera. And there's enormous pressure to do all of those things. but. If you're not conscious of what you're doing, you can slip away from the public mission. And our mission here is to make a world-class, superb education available to those sons and daughters of Oregon who are capable of succeeding in this place. And when I say world-class, I want an education that will allow every one of our graduates to compete with anybody in the world without apology, without anxiety. And we're there. We're doing that right now. But there's a real danger that we will let that public focus slip. And I think, I think in fact, we have let it slip in this country. 
and our goal is to preserve that public mission. And I think we can do that better if we have our own governing board who understands this institution and what we're trying to do here. I was struck by your use of the phrase, all of the students who are capable of succeeding here. So that means that the university is not bound to take all comers. And in fact, I believe that the pool of applicants to the U of O, the, the qualifications of that pool just keeps going up. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Um, in my view of, of, of a public university like this is that the admissions standard should be the capacity to succeed. If you're so gr grotesquely underprepared or if you simply don't have the, the talent or the maturity to succeed here, it's irresponsible of us to admit a student who is in that situation. We're taking a lot of money and a lot of time, and we know they're not capable of succeeding. However, if you are capable of succeeding, now what I want our admissions people to do is to take that much larger stack of applicants who are capable and eligible for admission and find the richest mixture of, from a socioeconomic region of origin, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual preference, political, everything. I want that freshman class to be as diverse as possible. And the reason for that is that students learn as much from each other as they do from you and me in our classes. And so the richer that mixture is, the richer the quality of the education. And that's what we're looking at. We've changed our admission regime this year, um, partly out of necessity, but mostly out of a strategic shift in this direction. We are, we're a very hot ticket right now, as you probably know, being the mother of a freshman uh, <laughs> yes. on this campus. Um, we had, uh, in 2007, we had 11,000 applicants. This year, we had 22,500 applicants. So in four years, we've more than doubled our applicant pool. The freshman class has not grown in size. It's becoming tougher and tougher to get in here. And when we talk to students about why they've come here, it is an increase in awareness of what, it, what the university is doing. And because they're aware of the university, they investigate and they find that this is a really terrific place to go to school. And we're a hot ticket. We had, I think, 45 applicants from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania this year. We didn't, I don't think we've had 45 applicants from Pittsburgh in the history of the university. So it's a, it's a really nationwide and international phenomenon. So what's making us a hot ticket? Well, uh, I'd like to think it's because of the new president. Uh, <laughs> of course. What else is making <laughs> us a hot ticket? Uh, <laughs> I think uh, it, it's always hard to know. Uh, word of mouth is out there for sure. It doesn't hurt that we're having athletic success. Uh, no one comes to a school because of the football. At least no one north of the Mason-Dixon line comes to school because of the football. Um, but they, you have to remember there are almost 4,000 four-year institutions in this country. So if you're an 18-year-old trying to choose where to apply, how do you identify which of those ten or so institutions you might apply to. You have to know about them. So you know about them from family members, from neighbors, from other kids who have gone places. And undoubtedly because of the noise that's made nationally around athletics. But very few kids choose to come because of the quality of the football program, unless they're a football player. Uh, they come because once they've identified, they say, oh, what about this place? And they find out that architecture is as good as you're going to find, education is as good as you're going to find, the humanities are better than almost any place you're going to find. And they say, oh, I think I'm going to go to that place. Then when they come here and see how beautiful it is and how human the size of this place is, it's, it's a really compelling story. Well, that's one of the many very successful aspects of what's going on here. Another one is another excellent year on the fundraising front. Uh, the university recently issued a report that showed it was, I believe, the third highest that's right. year in, uh, in intake of gifts. It's the fourth year in a row. We've raised more than $100 million. I think we had $117 million last year. And those gifts came from 46,500 donors which is quite remarkable given the fact that we have only 180,000 living alumni. So uh, 
just about a quarter of our alums gave money last year, and it's it's really wonderful and edifying. Those those gifts are probably the most sincere and compelling expressions of confidence in our future that you could have. One of the really striking things that's noticeable at this beginning of year as opposed to last year is a very different physical face to the campus. There's been a great deal of construction going on. Will you talk about some of your favorite highlights? Well, you're right about the construction. Uh, and as disruptive as it may be, it's, it's actually a symptom of the health of the, of the institution. We just opened uh, the spectacular new alumni center, the, the uh, Ford Alumni Center, Cheryl Ramberg Ford and Alan Ford Alumni Center. In there we have development, we have the, tr uh, the foundation, and we have the Alumni Association all working together. They're interacting together. Those three groups have to work closely together. But the really great thing about that building is that's where student tours initiate uh, throughout the year. We had, I think it was 7,000 tours year before last. Last year we had 23,000 tours. And when they come into that building, they get a sense that they're part of a whole fabric, that the minute you come onto this campus, you're part of a community, a family, as it were, that lasts for the rest of your life. You're a student and you're an alum, and you're part of the University of Oregon, and it's just wonderful. I do encourage anyone who hasn't yet set foot in it to come and look at it when they're on campus. It's, it's a very beautiful building, one that's um, highly environmentally uh, aware right. and conscious, and the, the lobby area that people see for the first time as they walk in gives that sense of the history of the institution, the future of the institution. It's very clever in its mix of electronics and right. more traditional media. Right. That combined with the Jaqua Center has put a whole new face on the east entrance to campus. <coughs> I'm assuming that was part of the plan. Yes, it is. Uh, the east entrance now is, is spectacularly new and, and high-techy and beautiful. Uh, and then you come on to the core of the campus and these beautiful old buildings are being preserved and renovated and, and uh, uh, you get a sense of being on an Ivy League campus, but looking to the future, not to the past. And so we've got, we've renovated the business school. Fenton Hall has just been completely redone from, took it right down to the dirt in the basement and redid everything inside. We've got a brand new 400 bed um, uh, dormitory that's going to be state of the art, everything that will come online next year. Um, and lots and lots and lots of plans for more building. I mean, it's a very healthy environment right now. Another area in which you are pushing the institution is the development of our international links. And I know there was a fair amount of publicity about your uh, meeting with the president of Gabon mm. and our new partnership there. It has, a, it has a long name. Can you help me out remembering uh, what has, <coughs> I'll look it up in case we need it. You, you will have to look <laughs> it up because I can never okay. remember the entire name uh, either. What is the import of that new agreement with Gabon? Basically, the ambassador to Gabon is an alum of the university. Um, he watched Gabon struggling with issues around tourism, sustainability, um, attention to the environment, management of forest lands, etc., and said, I know an institution that could probably help you with that, and uh, basically steered them in our direction. We then sent some folks out and uh, they engaged in uh, pretty interesting conversations with President Ali Bongo's uh, cabinet. Um, they are dead serious about trying to preserve what is apparently a spectacular environment, but also develop uh, in ways that will raise the general standard of living in the, in the country. They want to do this with the kind of sensitivity that our scholars and students bring to their, uh, their work in business development, uh, sustainable uh, practices around the development of cities, et cetera. And so they've entered into an agreement with us whereby we will uh, bring that expertise to bear in the, in the country and also provide education for students from Gabon here. And this is going to be quite an ambitious uh, relationship. 
It is, in fact, the Gabon, Oregon Transnational Research Center on Environment and Development. I was going to say that. <laughs> of course you were. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand why the University of Oregon's sensibilities and areas of expertise lend themselves especially well to this partnership. Tell me how Oregon students and faculty will benefit from it. Well, first of all, there will be lots of opportunities to study in country in Gabon uh, for our students and for our faculty. Uh, we're still in the process of working out exactly what those areas will be, but it will be in the area of sustainability, sustainable cities, uh, uh, sustainable tourism, et cetera. Uh, and also, our students will benefit because we are going to be the primary uh, venue for Gabon government-sponsored study by Gabonese students in the United States. They've got students uh, around the country in various places, some of which they're quite happy with, and some of which they're not, and they want to send more and more students here. And the richness that international students bring to that diversity experience that I was talking about earlier is really important. So we're looking very much forward to having a significant increase in Gabonese students on our campus. It's a great step forward in our internationalization and, uh, and a, a, a richness that we didn't have. Not to mention <laughs> that they are francophones. Indeed, indeed. And you said it the French way, I noticed. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, Richard, um, the, it's been a rough and tumble year in other ways. Many successes, also a lot of more difficult issues on which all of which uh, you lead from the front lines. So one of them is um, something that you may or may, may not have taken as a rebuke. You were renewed for one year by mm. the board as opposed to two or more. Uh, Register Guard ran an editorial that said, uh, do not punish him for standing up for the institution and the system. How did you feel about that one year reappointment? Well, you know, any time you're at odds with the with the body that that essentially hired you, it's it's difficult and it's been painful and unpleasant, um, and I've regretted all of those difficulties. Um, the fact of the matter, how, however, is that it's not about me, and it's not about the State Board of Higher Education. It's about the public mission of the University of Oregon, and what I was really hired to do is to preserve that public mission. And if that means we bring about the kind of change that the governor is contemplating now and that we have advocated for, which is a change in the governance of the University of Oregon, uh, a change in the structure of higher education in the state of Oregon, then that's what we have to advocate for. And it's regrettable that it's as uncomfortable as it is for some people, but uh, there's a larger set of issues than just me here. Yeah, I understand. Uh, but you're not planning to go anywhere from what no. we've seen. No, Indeed. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm here for the duration. Well, another long-term issue is, of course, um, the question of increases in salary <coughs> for all categories of UO employees from the classified employees through uh, the faculty, the officers of administration, and indeed the administrators in Johnson Hall and elsewhere. Um, you've come under fire in the press recently because the union has been negotiating and um, it was a long and difficult negoti mm. negotiation that's only just been settled before a strike took place. Uh, at the same time, the news came out that the University of Oregon, particularly, gave raises to a high percentage of faculty, officers of administration, right. and administrators. How can you reconcile those two? Well, first of all, the University of Oregon has very little participation in the negotiations with the union. That's, that contract is with the Oregon University system, not with the University of Oregon. So we have very little say in, in, in those negotiations. When I came here, I was astonished to see the level of salaries. Um, uh, we were, I think, on average at 80 percent of the average of our peers, of the comparators that the state board and the state uses to s compare the University of Oregon. Uh, that meant we were 20 percent below average. And in, a, in the terrible downturn of 2008, it didn't matter all that much because nobody was hiring and so there wasn't the kind of erosion that comes with that. Uh, this last year, we took some pretty serious hits. We had people leave uh, that we didn't want to leave. Um, and when you're in those situations, someone gets an outside offer, you can match the offer. 
in most cases. Not in every, but in, in most cases. But the conversation is, well, sure, you're doing that for me now, but what about the previous 10 years that I've invested in this institution where my salary fell behind my peers nationwide consistently? You didn't do anything. How do I know that if you match me now that you're not going to do the same thing to me if it, over the next 10 years? It's a hard conversation to have. And we have a lot of people who are world class here who have chosen to suspend their market play on behalf of this university for years. And there's only so far you can push that. So many times you can count on their loyalty, on their quality of life issues, et cetera, being keeping you 20% below average. We really felt uh, that I felt and, and many of us in Johnson Hall felt that this is the number one challenge to the university. Um, we saw the opportunity uh, to do so. We had the money because of the remarkable um, interest that there is on the part of students to come here, the growth of the student body. And for me, the judgment to put that in reserves rather than to invest it in the most important component of the university, which are the people who work here, um, wasn't really much of a decision. We, I felt we had to invest in them. The fact that we did it when we did was necessitated by the sequencing of, of various policies that were coming down from both from the system and the state. Uh, we had a very small window in which we, we did it. And um, well, if it had some positive effect on the union's position, that's OK, too, because those people are the least well compensated of all of our community. And we have worked pretty hard in the past to protect them from things like furloughs and so on to the extent that we've been allowed to. Uh, you may have noticed that I got in a little trouble for that, uh, trying to give some overtime to people who were forced to take furloughs by their contracts. Um, we've looked after them as aggressively as we possibly can. And yet, there's still some rhetoric about um, uh, a failure to share the sacrifices, as the catchphrase has it at the moment, across all the levels of, of this particular institution. Do you have a response to that? Well, we've managed our affairs very carefully here so as not to have to have those sacrifices. We did not have to have furloughs to balance our budget. And we knew going in that that was a possibility, and we avoided it very carefully by managing Jim Bean and his colleagues managed the money very, very well. The reason that some of our people had furloughs was that negotiation with the Oregon University system, that contract required furloughs. And uh, I was actually asked, in order to have shared sacrifice, could we please impose furloughs on the faculty and on the OAs even though we didn't need it to balance the budget in order that everyone should suffer. And that struck me as the height of absurdity uh, to, to have that kind of negative impact on the rest of the community because we had this, it made much more sense to deal with the classified employees and see what we could do for them. We're so thinly staffed here that when somebody is on a furlough for an extended period, we, somebody's got to do that work and it almost always involves some kind of overtime. So it only made sense that if we had to have overtime to make up for the furloughs, that we make sure that the furloughs, the people who had to take the furloughs were beneficiaries of the overtime to the extent that it was feasible. This was seen as somehow unacceptable and I got chastised for it by, uh, actually by the then governor, um, but I don't regret it. Let me turn the topic just a little. Another area of controversy at the moment is that uh, it looks like the NCAA is going to be investigating certain practices or certain actions that occurred uh, related to the football program. That's brand new, was in the paper um, just very recently. Um, do you have any particular insight into that and where it's taking us? Well, um, the allegations, uh, let's see, the, yes, it was a notice of allegation. Th these are formal steps that the NCAA takes, uh, just learned about. Uh, in the last few months. We have known for months that they were investigating and have fully cooperated with the NCAA. Um, 
in fact, everybody's been instructed to aggressively cooperate. We want nothing held back or, or uh, no reluctance to reveal anything because I'm pretty confident in our, in our, uh, our staff. So we've been involved in this all along and at a certain point they notice, they give you a formal notice that they're investigating. Well, they have been investigating all along and they just gave us that notice. We were expecting it. So it really isn't any news. It's just part of their process. Um, beyond that, I really can't comment on the details of the, of the allegations or our position because one of the conditions of their investigation is that we can't discuss it. But I can tell you that we are um, cooperating as fully as we possibly can and everyone has been instructed to do so and I'm quite confident in the integrity of our program. We have just about a minute left. Let's anticipate our conversation here next year. Mm. <laughs> Can you predict what um, some of your areas of focus will be between now and next year's fall? Um, I suspect that next year, uh, this time, we will be anticipating the next full legislative session. Uh, we should have teed up many of the details of the government's implementation of the new partnership plans. Um, we will be uh, still scratching our heads about the number of applicants. Uh, it will probably be a record again. We will probably break the record yet again for international students. Uh, and my hope is that we will have m continued to make the kind of spectacular hires that, already m that make an already superb faculty even better. And not to have lost some of the many exactly. superb people here. <laughs> Great. Richard, we're going to close there. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me again. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I'll look forward to seeing you next September. Okay. It's a deal. We've been speaking with Richard LaRiviere, President of the University of Oregon. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Thank you.